right, we can, all of our participants are starting to show up. We're so happy to see you. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Leslie Hendrickson. I am part of the steering committee of the New Rayport Literary Festival. And we're so happy to have you here for our first online festival. A few things before we get started. We are using the webinar format. That means you will not appear on the screen and you will be muted. So if you, have, if you wanna communicate with us, please use the chat. In the chat, I have put some information, a, um, a link to our website, which has more information about events today and on May 3rd and about all our authors. We also have links to our independent bookstore partners, the Bookshop of Beverly Farms and Jabberwocky in Newburyport. They have books from all of the authors in our festival and we encourage you to support them or your local bookstore. Um, we are gonna have questions at the end. This, the entire session is gonna last about 25 to 30 minutes. We will have questions. So you can put those in the Q&A section down at the bottom and I will field those at the end. And now I am going to introduce our author, Nina McLaughlin, who wrote the beautiful Wake Siren and she's going to read for us. Nina. Excellent. Thanks, Leslie. Um, and thank you guys all for coming. Um, I'm bummed that this wasn't able to happen in person, but I'm delighted that uh, the festival is taking place regardless. Um, so I'm going to read a quick chunk. This is from the, um, the Callisto story, which was actually the first story that I wrote. The Wake Siren is a retelling of Ovid's metamorphosis told from the perspective of the female figures transformed. Um, Callisto is uh, some background. She's, she's raped by Zeus and um, then turned into a bear by Zeus's wife. Uh, and the moment that I'm gonna read is the very end of the story where she, as a bear, encounters the son who was the product of that rape um, in the woods, he's on a hunt. So here we go. Even when 16 years later, I came upon my son in the forest. Arcus with bow and arrow on a hunt with his friends. He who had no knowledge of my fate or the violence of which he was the outcome. Our eyes locked and with a mother's love, I tried to tell him it was me, don't be afraid. And I took slow steps toward him, but he didn't recognize me. Of course he didn't, this bristled beast in front of him. And he raised his arrow toward me and I thought, yes, now, please, this is how I want to die, end the fear. And I raised myself on my hind legs and spread my arms apart to widen his target. My heart, my heart. And I hoped he had my gift of aim. I lifted my head and I smelled the smells of the forest, the sun on the leaves, the leaves on the ground, two rabbits nearby, a hawk swirled above us. I waited for the arrow to plunge into my flesh and stop my heart and end my fear. And I roared once, the loudest roar, a roar so loud the rabbits fled and the birds fled and the earth shook. But Job wouldn't let it happen. For him, this crime was too much, a son killing his mother. He swept us into the sky where we are now, even now, still now, a series of stars, Big Bear and little bear. I stay and burn and will stay and burn and my fire roars, but no one can hear it. I'm one of the luckier ones though, because I see the children on earth pointing up at me. Look, look, they say, the Big Dipper. And I think, I wish I could scoop you up, young ones. I wish I could ladle you up into me and keep you safe for all time. But I don't want them to know that when I seem especially bright, when I blaze in the sky, it's because I'm remembering that afternoon when my body was no longer my own. There are so many other stars, all of us, burning. And I see all the stars around me and I wonder, are you the same as me? Is this what we all are? Fires fueled by fury burning through the nights? Is that why you're up here? And you? And you? No place on earth for a fury so hot and bright, for a roar so loud. I wonder this. I see some blazing brighter and I think, what are you remembering? Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Nina. Yeah. Um, so in 
week, Siren, you have an author's note that describes the process of writing this book and how it basically started from a writing exercise that you did one day to get yourself back into the flow of writing. And I was hoping you could describe that to all of us and how that exercise took you in a whole new direction. Sure, totally. So I had just finished up, um, I, was, I worked for nine years as a carpenter and had just finished up a season of carpentry. Um, and so I hadn't been writing much and wanted to get my muscles, writing muscles sort of back into shape. Um, and I was reading through the metamorphosis as I sometimes do, it was just kind of flipping through. And I thought, oh, well, I'll just sort of rewrite one of these stories from, from a different perspective. And it was actually the Callisto story that I, that I did first. And it started, uh, I am a bear, I live in the sky, which just like <laughs> from the start felt pretty great. Like it felt like cool and exciting. Um, and so I wrote, I wrote that and then I was like, all right, cool. I'll, I'll do another one and did another and another. And almost instantly it was just like, all right, here we go. Um, and, and, it happened very quickly. Um, I wrote the book. I mean, it was really like in a little bit less than three months. Um, so it was really this kind of like outpouring. Um, uh, and I've never had, I definitely have never had a writing experience like that. You know, I mean, it was re really like um, my, my first book, Hammerhead, for example, took like three years and honestly like 11 drafts. So this was like, it was a way different process. Interesting. And you write in a lot of different styles, some more, more classic that sound a little bit more like the original Ovid and some very modern using you know, email format and, and you know, how we communicate today. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like to go between those different styles, both in the writing process and also I'm interested in the editing process when it was all together and then you're going back and forth between these styles? Sure, that's, that's a good question. So, I mean, partly with the, um, when I was doing, when I was working on it, I was going through in order. Um, the way that it exists in the book, it, it's not in order. This is not the way that these stories appear in the metamorphosis. Um, and so partly it was this, it was this reorganizing, um, sort of shifting things around, almost the way I think about it is like, I'm not, I'm not a musician, but the way I imagine what it is to like order songs on an album, you know? Um, and it was, a lot of it was balancing tone um and and mood and atmosphere with and like the sort of the epic register that sort of ancient sort of feel that you spoke of with the sort of much more modern sort of keeping a balance with those um which was sort of fun moving like flashcards around on my floor um in terms of the in terms of the sort of different tones of voice i i would sort of i would read through each story really closely and take notes and then um, I was going for these really long runs and I would just kind of, I would just sort of um, listen. I would listen to the, to the voices and I would just try to, when I was reading, I would try to look for the, like those tiny details that sort of, I don't know, brought these different women to life. Because in a lot of ways, like the stories sound exactly the same. Like, oh, nymph gets chased by God, is raped or saved and transformed into, you know, a rock or a river or a tree. And so it was like, all right, what is the telling detail that makes this, specific woman different. Um, and so it was this kind of like, God, it's hard to describe and not sound like an insano, but like, it was just sort of like listening to these voices. Um, and some of them just sort of naturally came up like, oh, I, this is the way I would talk to a friend. And some of them felt more like, you know, that kind of lyric, epic, um, ancient tone. So it's kind of, I mean, it was a little bit of a mystery. Um, but yeah, each one, I just sort of, yeah, I, I, I just listened. So what you're saying is you're an oracle. <laughs> yeah, exactly right, a total oracle. <laughs> and, and then the publishing process went pretty quickly for this as well, is that, is that the case? Yeah, it did. Um, uh, you know, I was, I was lucky. Um, I, I ended up um, with, a, with a really amazing, amazing editor at FSG, a woman named Jenna Johnson. Um, and uh, we, yeah, worked on it quickly and, and it sort of, yeah, it all, ha yes, the answer is yes, it all happened very fast. It all happened very fast to the point where it almost felt like I wrote it and sort of like it happened so quickly and, and sort of like, uh, it didn't feel real in some ways, you know? So even when it sort of came out, it was just like, wow, this, that, this, this thing came out of my brain. Like, how is that possible? Um, well, it goes back to our point about you're an oracle. <laughs> 
So when I was reading this um, and reading all the different perspectives of stories that I've known a long time, I was thinking a lot about the Me Too movement, which, um, you know, obviously last year was a huge movement and a push toward different perspectives and different ways of seeing things. And I wondered if that was on your mind at all when you were doing your writing. Sure. I mean, I think I would say that I definitely wasn't like, okay, I'm going to set out and write this sort of me too version of the metamorphosis that that certainly was not my intent. Um, but to say that that stuff wasn't, you know, in my consciousness would be, I mean, of course it was, you know, I mean, and has been for a long time. And I think in some ways, this isn't too like the small in me too. I think that it's, I think that it's in some ways, the fact that these stories have been repeating themselves for 2000 years um, is like, uh, it's bigger than this moment and has been going on much longer. And so the idea of kind of giving voice to these women who were not given voice, you know, for thousands of years, um, I don't know, felt, felt sort of, again, I, don't, I didn't sort of approach it in a political way, but, but, but it felt like, powerful um mm -hmm. yeah and i think i mean again it's telling it's telling these stories it's it's like over and over and over, over again and i think i love ovid i mean like the work is so the metamorphosis i recommend to everyone it's so alive and it's so sensual and it's these stories that like you know without knowing you know i think um what makes it that way? I mean, this is something I think about a lot as a person who revisits myth and these kinds of stories over and over and have for many years. But what keeps drawing us back to these stories that we know so well? And and not only us to the same volume, to Ovid again and again, but to different takes on, on these stories and new movies and Clash of the Titans. And, you know, <laughs> well, these myths are the backbone of so many stories and I just what's the ongoing appeal for you sure I mean I think in part it's I mean I don't know I, I you know I had that 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 the yellow spine Dallaire's myths when I was a kid which I feel like a lot a lot of people had um uh and I think it's as you say it's sort of the backbone of a lot of a, lo a lot of our our culture and a lot of our our stories and and I think what what I what I sort of found was that, you know, it's not just sort of like Western culture, the sort of things that come up in these myths are, are sort of humanity wide, you know? Um, and, and so I think that to me, these stories, they like, they, they, they live in our bodies, you know, they, they, again, to say, you know, like, we don't know, we know them, it, that there's something familiar about them, even if you don't know, okay, like, oh, what are the details of Arachne's story? What are the details of Io? These sort of, you know, some are known, some are lesser known. Um, the sort of, the elements are so human and, and, and again, so sort of, I think, resonant and really like, not just we learn them as children, but are sort of like, we, they're like, I don't know, it almost feels like to me, it almost feels like to me like we, we've known them even before that, you know, like it, they, they, we are born into them, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, so it makes for a s sort of segue into my next question, and I have maybe two more, everyone, and then I would love to take questions from the audience, so please put those in the Q&A uh, thread down below. But, you know, a lot of these stories are very violent toward women, in fact, almost all of them. Yeah. And when you're writing that, does, is that coming up and how is that coming up for you and how are you dealing with that? Yeah, I mean, you know, gosh, I, I guess I would in some ways describe the writing process. The, the three months that I was working on this really was like, it was almost like feeling sort of in this trance state, sort of like I almost was sort of outside myself. So in the moment, it wasn't it was sort of just like this, these are the stories. I'm just telling these stories. Um, reading over it afterwards, um, sort of for the first round of edits was like, it was actually quite shocking. You know, it was actually like quite jarring, like, oh crap, you know, like she's a wheeze. Like this is really intense. Um, there's one story, the Procne and Philomela story, which is, um, 
the sort of centerpiece of the book. It actually is in the literal center and it's one of the longest ones. And to my mind is in some ways the most brutal and the most violent, um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it really is terrible. Um, and working on that one, I remember, uh, I finished that one and, and it was like just feeling such a level of depletion, you know, and such sort of feeling quite wrecked mentally um, and being like, wow, fuck. Oh, shoot. Sorry. Sorry. Wow. I really, I need to take, you know, a few days off and really relax um, and get myself back together. Um, not all of them felt like that. Um, and I hope too that there, it isn't just like, you know, violence after violence and rape after rape. I hope there's moments of like, deep pleasure and also I think like joy I, I hope is also to be found even even in the like the grim and violent ones I hope. Um, one of our participants would like to know what tr your favorite translation of Ovid is and I know you have a good answer for that so I'll... Yeah totally so I I worked with um, the Alan Mandelbaum translation um, which uh, I love I love uh, and there's something quite, uh, again, sensual and alive. Um, uh, you know, I think that one of the things about the translations and one of the things I thought about a lot, and Mandelbaum is guilty of this in, in a few instances, but he also does use the word actually explicitly rape a couple times. But, you know, I mean, in a lot of these translations, mostly by men, um, you, have, you have all this euphemism. So it's, it's like, it isn't like, oh, he violently attacked her it's like, oh, he attained her love or like seduced her. And it's just like, no man, that's not what happened, you know? Um, and, it, and it did make me think a lot about like, okay, how, how is the actual language used over these centuries of these, of these stories being translated? How does that impact the way we understand them, you know? So it's like, if you read over and over again, like, oh, he seduced her, oh, he attained her love. Like, oh, that sounds fine. That sounds okay. Um, when in fact, the, the reality of it, like, no, this was like, this was a violent act against this woman's will. Um, but so, yeah, so I, I, I'm a, like a Alan Mandelbaum, Alan Mandelbaum fan to the max. Excellent. Um, how did writing this book give you a new perspective on the way women's narratives are presented in fiction and also the media and other forms of pop culture today? Wow, 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 good question. Um, I guess, you know, how did it, yeah, gosh, uh, I guess in some ways, you know, I mean, it's, I, I guess it's like, I, what, what I've done here is not new, you know, like people have been retelling these stories for a long time. Um, and I think that even giving voice to sort of the women characters, you see, I don't know, I guess it is happening a little bit more. We're noticing it with Madeline Miller um, and a few others right now. I mean, there's, there's sort of, there is this kind of like uh, surge, it seems like, of these retellings from female voices. Um, I guess it like, I guess all of it sort of underscores to me the fact that there are, there's always more than one side of a story, you know? And so being able to hear a voice that you haven't heard or that has been marginalized in whatever way. Um, and I think, I think it's like the importance of, of when you hear other people speaking out, it makes it feel more possible for you. And so I think in some ways like again, to link back to the Me Too movement, I think that's in some ways like, all right, yeah, this person is stepping up and this person is stepping up. Like, okay, that feels more possible for me to step up. And like that, that sort of, again, this sort of wave, this sort of surge will maybe sort of, oh, gosh, who knows, like shift things. Um, another one of our questions is about how masculinity can redefine itself and what kind of masculinity you would like to see in the future. Also, she likes your Cy Twombly print. Oh man, yeah, Cy Twombly, man, he's the best. I love Cy Twombly. Um, a new masculinity, I mean, that's an extremely difficult question. Um, gosh, which I feel ill-equipped to answer, but I'll, I will try. Um, I think that like, um, I think that it involves a lot of self-examination 
I think it involves a lot of very asking um, of oneself very hard questions um, and uh, like trying to trying not to be I feel like I feel like in these situations maybe there's a natural defensiveness that rises up and trying to kind of like peel back that defensiveness and um, really be able to use one's imagination to, to sort of hear a story, hear a perspective that feels foreign, you know, that feels like, oh, that's so outside of my realm of experience that I can barely understand. Um, so I think it's a, a, like a masculinity that is, that is like, gosh, open, uh, quieter, maybe, like a list, like an act of listening, you know, um, but yeah, that's a, that's a really tricky question. That's a really tricky question. Fair. <clears throat> um, what insight into Ovid's psyche did you intuit for <laughs> the purpose of recounting these stories? Wow. Okay. Gosh, you know, it's funny. I didn't actually think a ton about Ovid himself. This is interesting. Um, uh, what about his psyche? I mean, you know, wow. Um, I wonder too, I mean, if he was just sort of this conduit for these stories, um, uh, these sort of, I mean, he himself was retelling these myths. These were not sort of his original stories. Um, uh, I guess, I don't know. I feel like Man, I'd love to. I'd love to hang out with him, um, rap about some of this stuff. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I feel. I feel like able to, to sink into his psyche. Um, I mean, I feel like he was someone who was like an enthusiastic, liver of life. Um, I would imagine, um, someone who was sort of like, pretty into the human scene and all our our like uh, our our triumphs and our heartbreaks and our deep flaws um yeah cool i mean maybe I, I feel like maybe the next time i sort of read through ovid I'll, I'll sort of think more deeply about his 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 own subconscious fair enough do you have a favorite retelling of the metamorphosis other than wake siren of course um gosh you know as actually when when i was working on this book and still now um i was very very conscious about not looking to other reinterpretations. Um, I mean, there's, there's like, there's so many, um, uh, you know, even, even, even like the 1980s film Mannequin is an example, which like, I loved. I loved that movie. Yeah, I loved that movie as a kid. And like, you know, it's like, so it's like stuff like that. That's the, um, uh, Pig Pygmalion story, yeah. uh, which is done, I mean, that's been done a thousand times in a million different ways. Um, uh, so I don't have a favorite, and I think it was also, it was like protective, sort of not wanting that sort of outside influence to sort of come in, and maybe now protective in a way that's just like, oh no, like, that was done so much better, that was done, so, oh, I wish I'd done it differently. Um, there's a poet, um, gosh, man, and I'm, Planking on her name, wrote a beautiful collection called The World's Wife, which is um, these, uh, it's a collection of poetry, uh, not just for mythology, but um, sort of in the voices of many different sort of famous men's wives. Um, uh, I mean, Einstein, for example, but also many sort of fictional characters and many characters through myth. Um, Orpheus and Eurydice. Uh, Carol and Duffy. Yes, great, thank you. Carol and Duffy, that's exactly right, thank you. Um, that, that's a really potent collection. Um, I mean, this isn't Ovid specific, but I mean, gosh, Anne Carson rules um, and her sort of, uh, you know, dipping in and out of mythology is really, mm -hmm. to me, like no one does it better than her. Right, right. Um, two questions about your writing. First of all, when you were doing this book, were you doing other things? Were you also working on a job, you know, or were you working on this exclusively? And then secondly, how were you developing your tone and style through this book? Cool. Yeah. Um, so when I was writing this book, I was writing this book. I am um, a columnist for the Boston Globe as well. So I was doing that. Um, 
and you know, I freelance also. So, you know, I just had sort of like little projects here and there, but primarily at that point, it was like, I was working on this um, really every day. Like I didn't, I really didn't sort of stop. Um, and also sort of, you know, writing my column and um, doing a few smaller projects in the, in, at that time. Um, in terms of how my tone developed, you know, I think, I don't think, again, I don't think I was conscious of that in, in the writing. I think that it was like, in some ways, this book is, it rises out of, you know, my life writing and my life reading. Um, and I think it was a sort of like, at, at that point, that kind of culmination of, of, you know, all the things that I've read, all of the things that I'd written up to that point, um, you know, the, the life that I've had so far. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, so I think, like, it was, again, it was, like, this, this sort of, this, it, this unconscious, I don't know if that's the right word. This um, this feeling of like here's the here's the accumulation of what I have read and and written before this. Gotcha. Um, the cover of this book is beautiful. Did you have any input on the cover? Um, so the cover is um, designed by a um, tattoo artist in New York City, um, and his name is in the acknowledgments. And again. With nerves, I'm blanking. Um, Matt Buck, Matt Buck, um, and um, I did see sort of some few, the first few kind of iterations of the of the of the cover, and it was like it was such a fun process to sort of say like okay, because at first it was just kind of classic Medusa, you know, snakes, um, and then it was like all right, like but like could we get some more action in here? Could we sort of like signal to some of the other transformations that take place. And so you have, you know, I mean, it's like, we have the plants and you have an owl and like this little ferret. Uh, the colors are beautiful. Colors are so rich, you know? I mean, it's like, it really is electric. Um, yeah, it's a, yeah, a beautiful object, I think. It's nice to hold. I like that it's paperback as well. Because it came out first in paperback. There yeah. isn't, yeah. Very yeah. Cool. So that's, the FSU original series are all paperbacks. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I hate hardcover books. I think they're like, A, too expensive and B, so heavy. So this is like, it's just like, you can just like beat it up. You know, it's just like. <laughs> um, we're almost out of time. And so I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, but we really appreciate you being here. But I'm taking the last question sure. as the moderator. Please tell us about your next book, which is coming out on Monday. Yeah, gosh. Yeah, so I, I um, last year I wrote a series of essays for the Paris Review about the summer solstice. And um, I was approached by the editor of Black Sparrow Press, which is this like, very cool um, sort of storied press that did a lot of work with the beats. Um, uh, and uh, said like, you know, do you, have, do you have plans for those essays? And I was like, well, no, I, I don't. Um, and he said, well, we'd love to make a book out of it. So the um, the book coming out on Monday is called Summer Solstice, um, and it is a beautiful again. Like I'll sh I'll show it to you. Um, oh, it's a lovely. beautiful letterpress um, edition, uh, and it's slightly expanded from the stuff that was online. It's a little bit longer, but it's just this. I mean, it's just an it's sort of an a, a, a long essay about summer, which is actually my least favorite season. But I, I it's a very loving it's a loving. Ode to, to summer. So that comes out on Monday. Um, Amazing. Is there anywhere where we can see you um, in promoting that book? Totally. Um, uh, the Brookline Booksmith, which is a, like a like a hero of a bookstore around here, um, is hosting a launch um, on Monday night at 7 p.m. Um, there's details on their website, and I'll be in conversation with my editor at the Paris Review, Nadja Spiegelman, who's been just amazing to work with. Um, so I'm looking forward to that, I think. Amazing, well, I'm gonna put that on my calendar and hopefully um, see you there or at least um, be listening on Monday night. Nina, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And thank you to all of our participants for joining us online. I'm sorry we're not in real life, but this is the next best thing. Leslie, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for, for, for joining in. It was such a pleasure. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks again. Take care. Bye everyone.